Bibles, um, I'm going to, my main scripture will be 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 through 8. But I also want you to put a finger in 1 John, starting at chapter 1, the epistle of John, not the book of John, the gospel, the epistle of John, which is found toward the back of the Bible. Uh, we'll be looking at 1 John, starting at chapter 1, all the way through 1 John chapter 5. And we have a five-part question test today. Five questions that you have to ask yourself. And we will pause, and I would like you to honestly assess yourself. You know, you don't have to share with me. You're not sharing with anybody on this phone. This test is for you and you alone. And again, it's probably the most important test that you will take today. So starting at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 through 8, says it this way. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye that not your own selves, how that Christ Jesus is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye should know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, I will ask you to thumb your finger over to 1 John chapter 1. And, um, and I'll let you know when we get there. But we're going to be moving through the epistle of John chapters 1 through 5. Amen. So my text for today is your most important test. Will you pass? Your most important test. Will you pass? Only the truth of God will set you free. Nothing else will give you the breakthroughs in those areas of your life like the word of God. The Bible says in Hebrew 12 too, look unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. That means your life is completely in the Lord's hand. And if you keep your faith in God's hand and him alone, he will uphold you with the righteousness of his right hand. And that is a promise. In every problem, every situation, whether it's trial or tribulation, you are up against. You need to learn how to speak the word of God against that situation in your life. For Hebrews 4.12 says it like this. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word has all power. Not your words, but God's words. In whatever situation you may be dealing in life, I encourage you to find a scripture and meditate over that scripture over your situation. Now, how many of you all like taking tests? <laughs> how many of you all like taking tests? Me? <laughs> Me, I don't. And I have not taken a test in a long time. When was the last time you took a test? Now, how many know that many people don't like taking tests? But let's be real. Tests are necessary. And tests are designed to let you know just what you have learned and where you stand in your learning. And in many courses, if you pass the test, you get to graduate. However, if you fail the test, you do not graduate. In this passage of scripture, verse 5 states, examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. God wants us to test ourselves. And this is not an algebra test. This is not a history test. This is not a science test. But this is rather a test of your faith. Ask yourself, where is your faith? Sister Kendra said she don't like taking tests when she was in school. Me either. But it's a part of, 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 of going to school. But ask yourself, where is your faith? See, the world places its faith in friends, families, companies, different products, the government, money, etc., etc., etc. But as followers of Christ, God wants us to place our faith exclusively in him and his finished work at the cross. We are truly leading lives where people can see Christ Jesus written all over you. Can your family and friends see Christ Jesus written all over you? 
that person right there is a follower of God. The woman who loves the Lord, the man who is after God's own heart, can people truly say that about you? So what are, so those, what are some of those marks of faith? Turn with me again to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 7. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And I'm teaching preaching today. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanse us from all sin. Now, you are about to take this test. And again, this test is all about you. And I guarantee you will not find a more important test in your entire life. So the first question, how are you living? You know how we used to say it in the streets, how you living? What is your daily life like? Can you be convicted of living a life as a Christian? 1 John 5, 5, 6, 5, 7 says it like this. God is light. And if we live according to the word of God, we are living in the light, which means we are living godly. God is, in, God is light and we are living in the light of God. We are living close to God. I like to say he walks with me. He talks with me. He walks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Alexa, stop. <laughs> he watches me. If God's eye is on the sparrow, I know that he watches me. Living in the light means we're in a relationship with God. Many of us have been in relationships. Many of us have been in romantic relationships or marriages or friendships. And when you are in a relationship with someone, you want reciprocity, which means you want that love returned. How many of y'all remember that old song, I found love on a two-way street, but lost it on a lonely highway? How does it feel when you, how does it make you feel when you give someone your heart and your love and they stomp on it or they don't give it back in return? At times, this is just how God feels about us. God loves you more than you love yourself. And let's be real. You love you. How many of y'all love yourself? Amen. There's nothing wrong with loving you because ain't nobody going to love you like you. And that is all right. Ain't nobody's going to love you like you except God. People will know that you are a God lover by the way you show love. This is the ultimate sign of being a Christian, our love for one another. 1 John 5, 6 says like this, if we say that we have friendship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not know the truth. Anybody can say that they are Christian, but when you look at their lives, oftentimes it says something totally different. I was living in the past as a, what I call a double agent, shouting on Sunday after leaving the bars and parties on Saturday. I, your pastor at one time, was living a lie. How many know there is no in-between zone? You are either with God or you're not. And the person that lives a life as a double agent, the Bible calls you lukewarm. If, if we claim to be a Christian, but our lives are outside the light, we are lying to ourselves and we are lying to God. If our lifestyles don't reflect Jesus Christ, we are living a lie. So have you have your pens and paper ready? The first question is an A or B question. A or B. A, are you living in the light? Does the way you live reflect the presence of God in your life? Or B, are you living more in darkness than light? Are you saying one thing, but your lifestyle says something 
totally different. A, you're living in the light, or B, you're living in darkness. Give yourself an answer. Give yourself an answer. Give yourself an answer. Next question. Am I obeying like a Christian? So you say, how is a Christian to obey? Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 6. And it reads, and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keep his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Obedience means doing what you are told to do. And as Christians, obedience means doing what God tells us to do. We as Christians must follow the entire word of God. We apply the word of God to our lives. We keep his word. Keeping God's words means that we are aware of what God tells us to do and when God tells us not to do. Now, we are not perfect people. Where are my perfect people at? Anybody here is perfect. Raise your hand. Amen. For we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And there are times we, like Donnie McClurk says, we fall down. But how many know you got to get back up? Amen. We fall down, but get back up. Yeah. Nevertheless, Christians, genuine Christians, have a deep desire to obey their heavenly father. On the other hand, verse four states, he that save I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Disobedience stems from a heart condition. You have a heart problem. There are times we just want to do things the way we want to do them. Romans 7, 14 says it like this in the English Standard Version. For I do not understand what I am doing. For I am not practicing what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. And this was Paul who wrote 13, maybe arguably 14 epistles of the New Testament. He says, the good I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, guess what? Amen. That I do. Then he goes on further. Oh, wretched man am I. How many of us have sometimes you say, oh, Lord, oh, wretched man am I. Amen. 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 We all have been at this crossroad. We all like sheep have gone astray. But one day something got hold of you. Mm. Hallelujah, somebody. One day something got hold of you and you decided to no longer live a double agent life. So question number two, get your pens and paper out. Question two. Are you, A, are you doing what God tells you? Or B, are you more listening to the devil? Give yourself an answer. Are you doing mostly what God tells you? Or B, you find yourself oftentimes listening to the devil? Give yourself an answer. So what is your score so far? And I don't need to know. But this is between you and God. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth have not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning, for this purpose, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither have he loved not his brother. So my third question Am I a practicing Christian? God bless you. 
Am I a practicing Christian? Let's talk about sin for a moment. And a lot of churches don't want to talk about SIN because it turns a lot of folks off. But let's talk about it for a second. Many people get confused here thinking a Christian is never ever supposed to sin. The Bible in 1 John 1 8 says like this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But then I have a conflict here. Because then he said he who has the Lord does not sin if? That's not what he's saying. The sin mentioned in verse 6 is referring to habitual sin. It means you practice this sin over and over and over and over again. Thus we have two options in describing our practices. Righteousness means we are living in right standing with God. The only way to be in right standing with God is to have the Son, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. And how many of you all can attest that Christ Jesus is not only your Savior, but he's the Lord of your life? Amen. He's the Lord of your If he's the Lord of your life, give the Lord a hand of praise that you have gone from being the Lord of your own life to giving God complete control over your life. And how many know God is a good master? He's the only master that calls us friend. It's through the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that we're able to live the right life. Let me be clear. You cannot live this right life on your own. You can't because you will fail the test. John 15, 26 in the gospel says like this, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the father, he shall testify of me. How many of y'all thank God for the Holy Spirit this morning? Amen. Amen. It is only the Holy Spirit that gives you the strength to carry on, the strength to walk through this thing called life. Thus, evil is always present. But God has given us the power and the ability to overcome the temptations of the world only through his spirit. Righteousness means we have turned our backs to this dark and dying world and we are walking with Jesus. You there, if you're walking with Jesus, you are living the right life. Let me be crystal clear. As Christians... You are not supposed to fit in. You're not. You have been called out. Think about this. The king of the universe has chosen you. You have been called out. He has chosen you. That right there should make you say, thank you, Lord. You've called me out and you set me aside. You, my friends, brothers and sisters, you are chosen by God. Will you follow him? Now, unrighteousness means we are not saying no to sin, but rather yes. Before we accepted Christ, I know me, I was bathed in sin. I sought out sinful people. <laughs> I sought out sinful places. And I love these things. There was times I loved living in the darkness. But I soon realized the darkness did not love me back. <laughs> the darkness did not love me. Uh, understand this, my brothers and sisters. The world does not love you. Get that through your head. And I had to get through that through a thick, bald head. The world does not love me. And the world does not love you. So today, God is challenging us to make up your mind. Hard not your heart when you hear and feel the unctioning of the Lord pulling you closer to him. So question number three, get your pens and paper out. A, is your life marked by right living consistently? Or B, is your life inconsistent and oftentimes marked by living in darkness give yourself an answer question four am i living like a christian 
Turn with me to John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. And it says it this way. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. The word used for love in this passage means agape. It's the Greek word for agape. It means love. Love like God, to make a deliberate decision to love whether the object or person loves you back or not. How many of you all can relate? It's easy to love those who love you. Yes. Amen, somebody. But what about loving those folks who don't like you? What about those folks who talk about you, who backbite, who deliberately use you? That's the tough one. Can you love them when they don't love you? So we have two options in describing how we love others. First option is unconditional love. The ability to love unconditionally can only come from an encounter with God and his Holy Spirit. We have to realize God loved us before we loved him. Thus, this awesome experience with the love of God compels us to love God one another just like that we as christians have to love people no matter what even if they don't love us back even if they persecute us now let me be let me be clear i don't have to like you <laughs> and i don't have to hang with you especially if you hurt me over and over and over again but i do have to love you I have to love you. And love you may mean some, hey, I'm going to love you from afar. If I see you, I'm genuinely going to love you and I'm going to wish well in your life. But I understand that we may not be able to hang out or be good friends any longer. But I still love you. The other love is conditional love. Conditional love means this love doesn't take any effort. You love me, I love you back. You hate me, I hate you back. This is placing conditions on our love. And this right here, my brothers and sisters, is not agape love. Amen. So question number four, get your pens and paper out. A, do you love others unconditionally, even your enemies? And that's an amen or an ouch, Pastor, ouch. Or B, do you love with conditions? Do others have to meet your standards before you love them? Give yourself an answer. And our last question. Am I assured of being a Christian? Am I assured of being a Christian? 1 John 5, 11, 13 says it like this. And this is the record that God have given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. He that had the son have life. And he that have not the son of God have no life. These things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the son of God. And who is the son of God? Jesus Christ. Amen. I love the song. Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Sister David, I see you rocking of glory divine. Amen. Amen. How many know our assurance comes from having Jesus? Nothing else. Nothing else can satisfy you. It is not designed to satisfy you. God has put a void in all of our hearts specifically only for him to fill. That's why you look at people with all the money in the world, all the riches, and they still are unhappy because God never designed things to fill that void that he purposely placed in your heart. This means that we have trusted in Jesus Christ and accepted him again as our Lord and Savior. Let me be clear. You are saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> you are saved. You are his. You belong to God. 
Amen. And how many know God's a jealous God? Amen. And he's jealous because he owns you. He loves you. That's a good jealousy. I know folks like, how can God be jealous? If I created you and I made you for me and you turn your back on me, I have every right to be jealous. It's similar to like a husband and a wife. Once you made that commitment to me and you don't, I'm jealous because I've given you my heart. So God is a jealous. He's jealous over you. He doesn't want anything to replace him. Nothing should stand between you and God. And how many know the Bible says in my father's house are many mansions? How many know right now you got a mansion in heaven being made not by man? Hallelujah. I don't care. I may not have the best house on earth, but I got something that's waiting for me that the angels are putting together screw by screw. I believe my floor in my mansion is, is paved with gold also. My ring doorbell in my mansion in heaven has diamonds all around it. <laughs> I got a good imagination. Rest assured, my brothers and sisters, God has placed you in heaven and he's prepared a place for you. He has prepared a place for you. My last question, number five, and this is three, this is the A, B, or C, A, B, or C. A, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? B, have you only accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you still Lord over your own life? Or C, you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior at all. There's a lot of folks in church who have just been churched. They come to church because it's in their minds the right thing to do. But they have not truly committed their lives to the Lord. They have truly not committed to their lives to the Lord. So, A, you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. B, he's only your Savior because right now you're still lording over areas of your life. Or maybe your entire life. You still want to do things your way. Or C, you just have not accepted him as Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, look at your answers. And is this for you and you alone? Have you passed the most important exam on this side of eternity? If not, look at those areas where you need to spend more time with God. Look at those areas you may say, hey, you know, Lord, I know I got to get stronger on this question. And that's fine. Because you're not reprobate. We talked about that early in scripture. Reprobate means you have purposely said in your heart, I'm going to do it this way, no matter what the Bible says. Yeah. Even though God says it's wrong, I'm going to say it's right. But if you are still struggling with an area in your life, thank the Lord. And that may sound kind of crazy, but thank God because his Holy Spirit is still convicting you. But when you're no longer being convicted of an area, that's where you are, what I call the danger zone. And none of us want to be in that danger zone. So if you say, hey, I'm still struggling, your struggles, that's between you and God. If you have a close friend that you can share with that's not going to spill the beans and talk about you, say, hey, pray with me. I'm struggling in this area of my life. And when God delivers you out that area, you too, like me, will have a testimony. Yeah, I, 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 I lived a double life. I was a, a double agent. I was a double agent. I'm going to tell you a story. I remember when I was in college, we started a, a Bible study, a men's Bible study. And I was still, I've always known the Lord, but I was living a, a double life. So I decided to really commit at this men's Bible study to really turn my life around. And I remember going to this Bible study, I think it was every Tuesday or Wednesday, and we would gather together at this guy's house and we would study the word of God. But slowly we all started to drift away. You know how it is. You come, all of a sudden you miss, then you miss again. You miss, next thing you're no longer going. So that's eventually what happened with that Bible study. We 
Folks started out strong, but they began to drift away. Now remember, the Bible study leader, it was a white guy, I can't think of his name, but he was a white guy. And I remember I was back into my double life. <laughs> and I went uptown, I was 21 at the time, I went uptown to a bar. And I was hanging out, and that Bible study leader walked in. <laughs> and we both looked at each other, but we didn't say one word to each other, because we both were ashamed. We ran into each other, and we both realized we were living double lives. And the eye is the gateway to the soul. And we looked at each other, and our eyes said it all like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And then we act like we didn't see each other, and we didn't talk. Because we both were ashamed. Because we both know we should not have been there. Now, I wasn't there trying to witness the folks. Like some people like, well, Jesus went to the party, but yeah, he was there to witness. <laughs> yeah, all the time. But he was there to save sinners. He wasn't there to partake in the festivities of being sinful. I was there to partake in the festivities of being sinful. You know, I was there for everything but witnessing to somebody about the goodness of God. And I would say the white gentleman also, because he had a beer in his hand. And we looked at each other and we both were like ashamed. And that's when I really began to say, hey, I got to either choose life or choose death. But God, I cannot live lukewarm any longer. So you have your test today, my brothers and sisters. God has given you this test. You have your exam. You have your five questions. And I'm going to ask you to go over. And you don't, have, don't share your questions with me. That's between you and the Lord. And if you have an area in your life that you know you need some struggle with, pray over it. Ask God to help you. And how many know God will help you? Yes. God will help you if you want the help. He will help you. Amen. Amen. And amen. So we thank the Lord for the word today. We thank God for his word. For his word is powerful, more sharper than any two-edged sword. So we thank the Lord. Now, today is healing stream service. Healing stream service. And healing stream service means we're going to pray over. We'll have a special prayer right now. If you have an error in your life, whether it be a physical ailment or you have an ailment within your soul. Um, I ask you right now, bring it to the altar. But first, before you bring it to the altar, make sure you have no unforgiveness in your heart. If you have air or unforgiveness against someone, right now, in your mind, forgive that person and mean it. Because we can't ask God for nothing if we harbored unforgiveness. So whatever you're dealing with that may be an area unforgiving, somebody may have hurt you. How many of us have been hurt before? We, we all been hurt. And it's usually that person that you're real close to. Because nobody can hurt you like someone close to you. But if you've been hurt on this morning and you harbor some unforgiveness right now, forgive them. Take the next 10 seconds and you forgive them. You forgive them. Even if that person has passed on into the grave, you forgive them. Because now we're going to open up the windows of heaven and you're going to receive some blessings from God once you release unforgiveness. God wants to bless you abundantly, but you have to lay down unforgiveness.